Dr. Dorsey, um, how does Parkinson's compare to Alzheimer's and how fast it's growing? And can you just use the drug levodopa? Does that work? Does that solve the problem? So uh, uh, Alzheimer's is about five to 10 times more common. So in the United States, uh, there's about 1.2 million individuals who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. There are about 6 million with Alzheimer's disease. Said another way, one out of every 50 Americans, uh, we have you know nearly 200 people participating right now, four people on average will have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. One in 50 Americans today has Alzheimer's or Parkinson's uh, disease. Uh, brain diseases are the leading source of disability in the world, more than heart disease, more than infectious diseases, more than COVID, more than cancer. Um, the second question was, what was the second part of the question, Steve? Uh, can you just take Lividopo? Does oh. that solve the problem? Well, you know, uh, I was, uh, you know, American medicine is really good at saying diagnosis and what treatment. And usually the first treatment usually people are trained to think about is what medicine. So yes, uh, Parkinson's disease is loss of dopamine producing nerve cells in the brain. Mm -hmm. And the most effective medicine and a godsend for many people is levodopa. But all medications have their uh, side effects, including levodopa. And there are lots of other things that we should be considering. One, to prevent ourselves from ever getting disease in the first places. Cures are hard to come by, they're costly, they're disfiguring, and they're toxic. It's way easier to never have a disease in the first place than it is to uh, treat or cure a disease once you have it. Um, so in addition to medications for people with Parkinson's disease, we've mentioned uh, diet, the Mediterranean diet, high in fruits and vegetables, low in animal products, protecting your head. Uh, we mentioned exercise, and I think one thing we really haven't talked about at all, a big issue for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is air pollution. There was a study that just came out, uh, I think the last couple of weeks, uh, Dale or Dr. Blake will help me out with this, in PLOS Medicine showing that improvements in air pollution were associated with slower uh, rates of decline in cognition among people with Alzheimer's disease. I'll say that again. A lot of studies on Alzheimer's and air pollution have come out worldwide some of the best ones from China because they have some of the best pollution. Yeah, so improvements in air pollution can actually might be able to slow the rate of decline in air pollution. Uh, the evidence, as, as Steve, Dr. Blake was just indicating, is really increasing for the role in Alzheimer's disease and increasing not as much uh, for its role in uh, Parkinson's disease. I think it's also a very potent way of entry into the brain. You're inhaling toxins that are in the air that are hitchhiking, including heavy metals that are hitchhiking on the tiny pieces of dust and soot that you see in smog in LA. And those things are going into your, uh, into your nose. Some are small enough to get past your normal ways of sneezing or uh, coughing. And they enter your brain and into your uh, nerve cell that's responsible for smell and go back to the smell center, which is among the first areas that's affected in both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I would like to mention that there is another treatment for Parkinson's disease right. besides levodopa carbidopa. And that is by reducing protein to needed levels rather than excessive levels. And studies have shown quite a few of them. A uh, researcher and neurologist in Italy, Luciana Baroni, has published some great studies. One study is fascinating. Uh, they took a group of people and they've already changed their diet to where they were eating a low protein breakfast and lunch. They were down to 67 grams of protein a day. Now adults need about 46. So during the study, half of them lowered their protein down to 49. And the amazing thing was that the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale was twice as good and results did not take long at all. Also the Hone and Yar scale improved by about double. So this is a fantastic way to treat people. It's very effective. It's effective in the short term and the long term. And the reason is because levodopa is made in all of our bodies with or without Parkinson's disease. It's made from tyrosine through the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. And tyrosine is an amino acid that when you eat a lot of protein in a meal, much more than you need, which is what Americans do at every meal. Americans tend to eat 50 grams each meal of of protein, they only need 50 grams in a day. And this excess amino acids interfere with the only transporter into the bloodstream, that large neutral amino transporter. Also from the bloodstream more critically into the brain, the large neutral amino acid transporter is clogged like a rush hour traffic. And the tyrosine can't get into the brain to make through tyrosine hydroxylase, make levodopa. Now this occurs both in people with Parkinson's disease and without. 
So you're effectively increasing their levodopa that's made in their body by reducing the protein. This reduces symptoms just as if you'd given them more levodopa. It also is fantastic, increases the levodopa effect on the person. Now, we all know that you shouldn't give levodopa at the same time as a large meal, right? That's standard advice. But it is the protein that interferes with the transport of levodopa as well as the tyrosine. So you're interfering in two different ways with our ability to make dopamine by having the usual excess of protein instead of just the amount that you need. And there are, of course, many diets for more advanced Parkinson's that we have developed. Uh, my wife has a cookbook for Parkinson's where you can get plenty of calories, but not too much protein so that you are able to cut your symptoms in half.